Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Have you ever thought how wonderfully beautiful a sunrise and early morning can be, how much untapped beauty and unspent energy it holds, how easy it is to breathe in the invigorating morning air, and how peaceful and tranquil everything is around you? Isn't it the reason why inspired, goal-oriented, and enthusiastic people try to wake up early and dedicate their mornings to themselves? Some meditate during this time, others do yoga, go for runs, or simply indulge in a relaxing bath. Undoubtedly, the morning is the time for those who are in love with themselves. Only those dissatisfied with themselves, the insecure losers, can sleep peacefully on such a wonderful morning. They sleep, completely forgetting that in the morning, they have to get three children of different ages ready for school and kindergarten, go to work, and manage a damn load of tasks. This was the kind of deep and peaceful sleep Nuria enjoyed. She was a fairly young and still quite attractive 35-year-old woman, a mother of three children whom she raised on her own. Yesterday had been epic, as her eldest daughter would describe it. At 17, Anna seemed to know everything about life and had no desire to stand out. However, even yesterday, she added a couple of gray hairs to her mother's head. Anna's teacher called around 10 in the morning and asked Nuria to come to school because Anna had done something terrible. What? What can a senior student do a month before graduation? Nuria wondered as she was going through the city on public transport. Couldn't she wait until graduation? It turned out that one girl in the class had been mercilessly bullied for a long time. Anna, who had neither friends nor enemies, had not bullied him, nor had she rushed to defend her classmate. The fittest will survive was the law of nature. However, today, the calm Anna calmly poured a plate of soup over a classmate's head. She did without emotion and not for the camera, so any stupid challenge could be confidently ruled out. Revenge was also out of place, as the girl had not conflicted with her classmates, and she didn't even communicate with this wealthy guy. Nevertheless, a plate of soup was poured onto the neatly arranged hair of the most stylish boy in the class. Fortunately, the soup wasn't hot. And his father is a big shot in the administration, the teacher whispered almost confidentially. Did you find out why she did it? Nuria couldn't believe that Anna could be involved in any conflict. Among all the children, she was the most reasonable, if not downright cold-blooded, realist to the bone, and yet she had pulled off such a stunt. She's silent, and the other kids mostly keep quiet or say she was in the wrong. I want to talk to her. Nuria was sure her daughter didn't do this without a reason. Anna, what did this boy do? The woman decided to take her child's side right away. Nothing special, just spat on the plate. It seemed that Anna didn't attach any importance to her actions and didn't understand why there was so much fuss about it. Last week, the kids were throwing mashed potatoes at each other during lunch, and no one even tried to stop them. In yours? Nuria was genuinely shocked by what she heard. No, Pamela's. They've been tormenting her for a long time, but the teachers don't care because his dad is a big shot, and she has a truck driver for a dad. And you stood up for this girl? I didn't stand up for her, I just gave him back what he carelessly threw onto someone else's plate. Mom, believe me, if I had poured soup on a less significant person, no one wouldn't have called you. I'm curious to know how you're going to handle this, Nuria turned to the teacher, burning with indignation. The girl will have to leave the school. What? Are you out of your mind? I meant the question of the classmate's behavior towards the girl. Your daughter is exaggerating, the homeroom teacher said emphatically, casting intimidating glances toward Anna. My daughter is the only one who acted with conscience, and it's not you telling us to leave. We ourselves won't stay a minute longer in this nightmarish place. The best school in the city, you mean, the teacher added sarcastically. The worst educational institution is one where kindness and compassion have no place and where money and connections take precedence. A few minutes later, Nuria and Anna left the school, only returning for their personal belongings and to return textbooks. What have we done, daughter? This is indeed the best high school, and you were doing well. You could have gotten into a good university. Mom, I'll get into a university anyway, 
and I've been tired of commuting to school across the city for a long time. Thanks for standing by my side. I never doubted you. You're the coolest mom. Where else could I do? Nuria smiled. On the same day, she transferred her daughter to a school located right next to their home. Her son, Marcelino, who didn't show much promise and was hyperactive, had been attending that school for a couple of years. This boy seemed determined to live up to his name, causing trouble on a grand scale. If he misbehaved, it was on a school-wide level. If he experimented at home, it required major repairs. And today, he decided to test the nerves of his teacher and slipped a dozen frogs into her bag, carefully caught the previous day in a nearby pond and stored in a basket on the shore. Sometimes, Nuria marveled at where he got so much imagination for mischief and so little for studying. In general, the new school turned out to be quite convenient for her. The young, frightened teacher rushed to complain to the principal just as Nuria and Anna were there to submit their transfer documents. For the first five minutes, the girl couldn't even utter a word, choking back tears and pointing at Nuria. Finally, Anna understood what was going on. Did Marcelino do something again? The teacher nodded silently, vigorously enough to make her glasses slip off her nose. Buttons? Mud? Ants? She listed Marcelino's recent escapades that she had managed to thwart. Fro, frogs, the woman stammered, trying to drink from a glass offered by the principal's secretary. It should be noted that she was a highly sensitive person, completely unprepared for working in a children's environment. Practically every day, she wrote angry messages in Marcelino's diary and called Nuria to complain about his latest misadventure. Frogs, he brought frogs to school. The principal suggested, referring to a young man who had taken the post just a year ago and was still trying to understand all the issues and work conscientiously. Yes, the girl said, crying. Not only brought them, he put them in my bag, a whole bunch. And I. I'm scared of them, the teacher finally burst into tears. The principal sighed deeply, exchanged a long, understanding look with Nuria, and tried to calm the young colleague, urging her to calm down. Well, Lola, it'll be all right. It's not a hedgehog, after all. It's just a harmless frog with no claws or teeth. Lola, I'll talk to my son, I promise, and I'll punish him severely. He'll apologize tomorrow, and there won't be anything like this again, Nuria lied, understanding that her son's cunning imagination would provide material for more such hysterics from the young Lola. And I'll supervise it. Anna decided to intervene since she was the only one with real power over her brother. She was the one who raised him and helped her mother when this chief was born, and he listened to her and understood without words. Nuria sometimes thought that he loved his sister more than his mother. But she didn't get jealous, such a friendship between brother and sister is a rarity and is worth its weight in gold. They had to pick Marcelino up from school early, and Nuria had to take time off work to explain the situation. As she left the school, Nuria said to herself, now all that's left is for Valeriana to do something at daycare, and the day will be as colorful as it gets. At that moment, her phone rang. It was Valeriana's daycare teacher calling. Nuria, could you please pick up Valeriana earlier? Yes, what happened? Nuria began to mentally prepare herself for various scenarios. While playing outside, Valeriana climbed a tree and fell. She bruised her knee. I've already had the nurse take a look at it. The daycare teacher seemed on the verge of losing consciousness from fear as a situation like this could cost her job. And what was she doing up in the tree? Nuria asked wearily, waving her hand in response to the unspoken question in her older daughter's eyes. She climbed up to rescue a kitten, and the other kids distracted me. I didn't notice. I'm sorry, it's my fault. How different people feel about their responsibilities, Nuria thought, remembering how rudely Anna's teacher had spoken to her in the morning. Don't worry, I'll pick her up right away. We're just at the school. 
The school and daycare were within walking distance, which Nuria considered a heaven-sent gift, as she couldn't have managed to shuttle her three children back and forth to different educational institutions twice a day, lacking both the time and energy. In the evening, the long-suffering family gathered for dinner. The eventful day didn't even seem worth discussing. Anna knew that her mother supported her and wouldn't scold her, even though the transfer to another school had disappointed her. Marcelino, having received a good scolding from his sister, tried to blend into the couch and not attract attention. Only the little five-year-old Valeriana actively and in great detail recounted how she had climbed the tree, rolled a toy car up it, and ended up hanging from a branch as she was caught on her thighs. Weren't you scared at all? Anna was the only one able to engage in conversation with her little sister. No, there was a cat up there. Valeriana attended speech therapy sessions, but her speech still contained incorrect words and sounds. You should have called for adults. I'm brave for myself. Why would I call? The little girl was genuinely puzzled as to why anyone would leave a helpless creature in trouble. Nuria looked at her daughters and felt a sense of joy. She had wonderful girls. Anna and Valeriana were completely different from each other. While Anna physically resembled her mother more, Valeriana was the spitting image of her father, whom she would never get to see. Their characters were also opposite, cautious and balanced. Anna was sometimes horrified by the daring and active Valeriana. Despite their significant age difference, the girls got along perfectly. After working until almost midnight, Nuria, who worked as a proofreader and managing editor at the local newspaper, as well as occasionally taking on coursework and thesis writing, found it difficult to motivate herself to get up. Yesterday was over, and today was all about dealing with its consequences. Valeriana happily went to daycare, promising not to rescue kittens on her own anymore. Marcelino solemnly pledged to apologize and not cause any trouble for at least a month. In the end, he agreed to a week, but it was clear he wouldn't last three days. Anna went to her old school to return her textbooks and retrieve her personal records. Afterward, she planned to visit the new school and check on Marcelino, who seemed genuinely delighted that his sister had transferred to his school. Now he had a protector against any misadventures. It was precisely today that Nuria overslept and was running late. A second day of absence from work wouldn't be forgiven. So her boss was already getting nervous every time she asked for time off or a sick day. Hastily getting her youngest ready and securing a promise from her eldest to take her brother to school, Nuria rushed to the bus stop and to say she was running late would be an understatement. Not only did the entire family manage to oversleep, but they also seemed to be moving extraordinarily slowly, at least that's how it felt to Nuria. By the time her entire family was out of the house, she had only 10 minutes left to reach her workplace. Even in their small town, getting there in such a short time was only possible if you lived in the neighboring block. For some reason, it was precisely at this moment that Nuria remembered her husband. Pablo was the only man in her life, and he was so perfect that Nuria constantly felt not worth enough next to him. He was tall and handsome, and she was short and plain. His blue eyes and magnificent chestnut hair drove more than a dozen girls crazy, while Nuria hardly caught the eye of a couple of guys. They were different in every way, yet they were together. Nuria was studying journalism at the Pedagogical University, while Pablo was majoring in foreign languages and preparing to dedicate his life to a career as a translator, traveling to different cities and countries. He had started mountaineering during his student years, and this passion consumed him to the point where Nuria was often scared. Throughout the school year, he worked as an industrial climber, hanging advertising banners on tall buildings, and during vacations, he embarked on expeditions to conquer mountain peaks, bringing back the somber news each time another one fell. Amazingly, the loss of friends did not deter him from his hobby. On the contrary, he learned from their mistakes and prepared more thoroughly for the next trip. They met at a college party celebrating the beginning of the studies of freshmen who had already turned into real students. Nuria was only 16 at the time and was immensely proud of becoming an adult, even though she was younger than the other students. Despite her pride, she looked barely 12, and Pablo approached her as if to escort this seemingly out-of-place child home from the inappropriate gathering. 
However, to spare the girl's feelings, he decided not to mention it. He introduced himself and suggested they step outside of the noisy and stuffy room. As they talked, they walked to Nuria's house, and Pablo finally explained the reason for approaching her. Nuria, who was overjoyed that such a handsome guy had taken an interest in her, instantly deflated. I'm actually 16, and I'll be 17 in a couple of months. I'm a student too, you know, and I got in on my own, she said. You're a smart girl. I'm sorry, but you really do look much younger. I thought someone had brought a little sister or a friend. But anyway, you're still a bit too young for these gatherings. Pablo noticed that he had disappointed the girl. But aren't you much older? Not really. I'm 19, and I'm in my third year. Well, you're practically an old man, Nuria teased, smiling. In the morning, the young man came to escort her to class. A connection that seemed impossible to make had been established, and it grew into strong mutual feelings that eventually led to the birth of Anna two years later. Nuria, still a child herself, struggled with her new role. Fortunately, grandmothers, friends, and even Pablo's friends helped out. With great effort, she managed to excel in university and secure a good job at the local newspaper with the potential for career advancement. By the time Anna turned eight, she started asking for a little brother, and her parents couldn't find any arguments against it. That's how Marcelino appeared. It's worth noting that even after this addition to their family, the couple didn't find time to get married. As a result, the children bore their mother's surname, a situation that suited everyone perfectly. Both Nuria and Pablo were raised by single mothers, as their fathers were not ready for family life. Nuria's father succumbed to alcoholism, and Pablo's father left his family for a young secretary. Both had a biased view of marriage, believing that feelings were far more important than marriage. Pablo's planned career as a translator didn't materialize, but he found his calling as a coach. Athletic, handsome, and with a sense of humor, he attracted a line of people eager to receive individual training. Yet he only had eyes for Nuria. As soon as Marcelino reached the age when children usually started going to daycare, Nuria realized with horror that she was expecting another child. No, she wasn't afraid that her husband would leave her with three children. She was more certain of him than she was of herself, but she was terribly tired of maternity leaves, sick days, runny noses, and scraped knees. She desperately wanted to live her life, dress up for work, meet friends, and travel with her beloved. That's why she decided to wait and not tell her husband about the upcoming addition to the family. In secret, she planned for there not to be an addition at all. That summer, old mountaineering friends invited Pablo on an expedition to conquer some new, extremely challenging mountains. Perhaps if she weren't pregnant, Nuria would never have let him go, but remembering her recent bout of despair and seeing the fire in his eyes when he told her about his friend's plans, she decided that she had no right to keep him home and deny him the feeling of freedom before he once again immersed himself in diapers, nighttime cries, and endless sick days. She couldn't rid herself of the child and decided to surprise her husband upon his return. Knowing how difficult the early months of pregnancy could be for a loved one, Pablo would never have left if he had known. Later, sitting by his grave, she would replay those events in her mind, imagining how their lives would have turned out if she hadn't let him go or if she had told him about the child. Pablo died on the very first major ascent, his prolonged absence from mountain training taking its toll. He mistook his condition for a cold, he didn't say a word to the medic. And when he fell, barely avoiding tumbling into an abyss, it was clear to everyone that they couldn't lower him below the critical point in time. Valeriana was born without her father. He never found out about her. Nuria named her daughter after Pablo's mother. Grief literally crushed the woman. Being a strong, lively middle-aged lady, she turned into a hunched, grief-stricken old woman, her face darkened by sorrow. After living for about half a year, she followed her son. Nuria sold her apartment, which allowed her to survive in the early days of her maternity leave. She even managed to pay off most of the mortgage on her apartment. As soon as Valeriana turned one year old, Nuria sent her to daycare and returned to work. Why do memories come at the most inconvenient times? 
Nuria grumbled to herself, wiping away a stubborn tear. The bus, now stuck in a long line of traffic jams, was slowly taking her to work. She had been late for 20 minutes already. Her boss had called twice, and she had explained herself, citing traffic jams. Getting off the bus, she quickly made her way through the courtyard of a residential building toward the newspaper office. Despite trying not to look around, she couldn't help but notice a body slumped unnaturally on a bench. Cursing herself for her soft-heartedness, she continued running toward the bench. The old lady she found there was as pale as a sheet and barely breathing. Apparently, the heat, which had already broken records early that morning, had taken its toll. Wetting a handkerchief with water, Nuria placed it on the old woman's forehead and tried to give her some water. Holding her phone to her ear, she attempted to call an ambulance or seek help. Unfortunately, the courtyard was empty, as everyone who had to go somewhere in the morning had already reached their destinations. Glancing at her watch, Nuria realized with resignation that being an hour late was tantamount to skipping work and calling her boss now wouldn't change anything. After dialing the emergency number, she quickly explained the situation and opened the old woman's purse, trying to find some medications as per the dispatcher's advice. Elderly people usually carry medication with them for unforeseen circumstances. This granny had clearly left her apartment that morning for more than just a leisurely stroll. In the old, battered purse, Nuria found a substantial bundle of money. She had never held such a large sum of cash in her hands and had never seen bundles of money like these. Nervously, she closed the purse, fastening all its locks and clasps. Afterward, she rummaged through her own bag, but all she found was pain relievers and a mint candy. The old lady, feeling the coolness on her forehead, opened her eyes and tried to say something, pointing to her purse. I know, it's securely closed. No one will take it. Everything will be fine, Nuria tried to reassure the elderly woman, realizing that the large sum of money could well be her savings accumulated over a lifetime. Thank you, the woman whispered with her trembling lips. Surprisingly, an ambulance arrived quickly. Nuria had no choice but to go with the elderly woman. She held onto Nuria's hand tightly. To be honest, Nuria was worried about what would happen to the woman. The small, hunched elderly lady reminded her of Pablo's mother, and they even bore some resemblance. Therefore, when the medic asked if she would accompany them, Nuria confidently agreed. She wrote a message to her boss, I'll call later and explain everything. She couldn't bring herself to call, but he didn't respond to her message, and that was a very bad omen indeed. The entire editorial team knew how the chief liked to shout. He never missed an opportunity to give someone a good dressing down. If he remained silent in response to mistakes, there was no doubt that the person in question had already been fired. Just yesterday, Nuria found it suspicious that he didn't scold her. Today she realized she would have to look for a new job. Strangely, she wasn't even scared, although there were plenty of reasons to panic. She was a single mother with three children, she had a mortgage, and she was an elderly mother. Her eldest daughter was graduating and becoming a college applicant, while Nuria had no savings, daily expenses, and the clear prospect of unemployment. And what could she do? Nothing. She could only read other people's articles and give birth to children. She could hardly remember the last time she wrote even a single line. She had been an excellent editor, but she couldn't develop her journalistic talent. Writing coursework never felt like creativity to her. The strictly formulated topics were like a corral for a horse. There was no room to run. It was different when she wrote her own work as a student, free, vivid, talented, and alive. Her professors saw great potential in the young freshman, which was quickly overshadowed by her first love and then the care of her first child. It was thanks to that mentor and his connections that they hired a recent graduate with a small child for a decent position at the newspaper with the prospect of rapid career growth. It was through his influence that she became an executive editor within a year. He had repeatedly urged her to write and publish her own work. It's like an addiction. Trust me, once you start writing, you won't be able to stop, he used to say. But what should I write about? about Anna going to school soon or about what her little brother is asking for. 
Well, then open a column for young moms. The elderly teacher couldn't easily accept that this young woman had buried her obvious writing talent under a pile of diapers and baby wipes. Maybe I should write books again? She said with a laugh. Maybe you should. You never know where success will find you on your life's journey. However, Nuria was never ambitious. She was talented, determined, diligent, and goal-oriented, but ambition had never made her dream of dizzying heights in her career. After a while, Marcelino was born, and Nuria completely forgot about that conversation with her professor. Although he tried to spur her on with new ideas at first, he eventually gave up. You can't drag someone towards success when they're digging in their heels, he told her, but his words had no effect. Fortunately, she was hired without too many questions when she returned after a long maternity leave and her husband's death. At first, they didn't nitpick about her, understanding how difficult it was for her to be left alone with young children. However, her boss's patience lasted only a year. Often, Nuria had to leave sick little ones with her elderly mother or her older daughter. Anna was a real pro at childcare from a young age. She could cook porridge, change diapers, and administer the necessary medicines. I asked for a little brother or sister myself. What can I do now? She would smile when, instead of extracurricular activities, she had to treat Valeriana's or Marcelino's runny noses. Their daughter took the best from both parents. She was smart and talented, a bit of a risk taker like her father. She looked more like her mother, but Nuria knew her little girl would find her own way. The elderly woman was sent to the intensive care unit with suspected heart problems. After calling her older daughter, Nuria waited to hear what the doctor would say. The woman might need some items or medication, but there was no way to contact her relatives. She didn't have a phone with her. They could have gone to the house where the elderly woman had fallen ill and asked about her, but that was unlikely to help. The house was next to the office building, right next to the newspaper's headquarters. Nuria stubbornly tried not to think about work, calculating how long their money would last and whom she could borrow from. After half an hour, the doctor came out with good news. It wasn't a heart attack, it was just exhaustion together with the heat, so it had caused a spike in her blood pressure. They planned to keep her under observation until the evening and then send her home. You can visit your mom if you want. Just put on a gown and shoe covers. Talk to the nurse at the station, the doctor said. Nuria didn't bother to mention that she didn't even know the woman's name. Walking into the hospital room, she saw the woman sleeping. Nuria decided not to wake her, considering the stress she had endured today. However, after a couple of minutes, the woman opened her eyes and asked, Did you save me? You could say that. I just called an ambulance. You could have walked by, made it to work on time, and gotten a good scolding from your boss. But there wouldn't have been any problems, the elderly woman said quietly. Nuria shivered at these words. How did you know I was in a hurry to get to work? You're all young, always rushing to work. Half a lifetime at work. But when will you live? When will you raise your children? I have time now, but the taste for life is gone. I'd rather be working now and spending more time with my family and my youth. Please, tell me your name. Do you have any close relatives? They must be worried, I'm sure. I'm Anna Ramos, and there's no one to worry about me anymore. There's no one left, the old woman said sadly. I'm sorry. Nuria felt both awkward and lighthearted. If she hadn't stopped, the woman might have died. If she hadn't gone with her, the woman would be alone in the hospital room right now, and in the evening, she would have had to make her own way home. What if someone had taken the money from her purse? But now Nuria was with her, and work didn't matter. The person was more important. Why are you apologizing? You didn't do anything wrong, did you? The elderly woman genuinely wondered. I'm apologizing because I reminded you of your loss. By the way, I have a daughter named Anna too. Yes, all that's left for me is my memory, and even that is failing me. I have to remind myself, or I'll become a vegetable. The old woman was quite spirited and didn't hold back her words. 
Here's your purse. I looked inside it, searching for medication. Nuria handed the woman her belongings. You really tied it up well, afraid things might fall out, the lady mumbled, undoing all the locks on the purse that Nuria had fastened, fearing she would take something out. I've never seen this much money before, Nuria said sincerely. I sold the house. My husband left it to me, but I couldn't afford to keep it anymore. What do I need it for all alone? A warm corner and sweet coffee are all I need. I was taking the money to the bank. I thought of it. I should find someone to take care of the summer house. I've completely let it go. I had a garden there, and what a beautiful flower bed. And the berries I grew. The grandmother blossomed, reminiscing about her beloved hobby. I know nothing about gardening, Nuria admitted honestly. My parents didn't have a summer cottage, and I've lived in the city all my life. Then the children were born, and there was no time for it. But your husband loved the land, nature, and life in general. You basked in his love, and when he left, you dimmed. You're alive, but it's as if you're not. Nuria felt a second wave of shivers, but this time she decided to find out how the old woman knew so much about her. Who knows? Maybe it's a gift of yours? She smiled at Nuria. But the feeling of unease didn't leave her. Maybe I didn't use this skill. And when people started taking too much interest in it, I just stopped talking and started watching my words to avoid saying too much. Where do you live? I can walk you home when the doctor lets you leave. When the old woman mentioned her address, Nuria was relieved. The two women lived in the same building, just with different entrances. Maybe you just saw me with my husband, that's why you know what he was like, the woman suggested. Maybe. Anything is possible, Nuria thoughtfully replied. But Nuria understood that it wasn't about that. This old woman seemed to genuinely possess some hidden gift. After lunch, the doctor announced that the elderly lady was in good health and could go home. Escorting her home, Nuria promised to visit and check on her health. Nuria, do you really need this job at all? Maybe you're wasting your strength on it. I have to raise my children. There's no choice, and they pay well here. What did you want to do in life before you started working? To study? I can't even remember anymore. Nuria genuinely couldn't understand where the old woman was leading the conversation. Try to remember. Will this job really make everything okay for you? I doubt it. I keep taking days off. Yesterday, I got busy with the kids and left early. Today, I didn't show up at all. Did your boss get upset? That's the problem. He didn't. When he gets upset, there's a chance. But when he's silent, it's like you're already fired. He was holding his tongue today. He was just busy. It wasn't about you. He has his own troubles. How do you know? I told you, I don't know where it comes from. I just know that's it. The elderly woman reminded Nuria of Marcelino. He used to sulk in the same way when his mother couldn't understand the reasons behind some of his actions. I didn't mean to offend you, she smiled. Why don't I make you some coffee or prepare a meal for you? With these words, Nuria approached the fridge and discovered that it was empty. Anna, did you eat today or yesterday? I did. You're lying to me. All right, I didn't. You must feel weak from hunger. Let me go grab something. Nuria quickly went to the nearest store and bought a whole bag of groceries, trying to pick a variety since she didn't know what the woman might like. After preparing a quick lunch, Nuria fed the elderly woman and made her a fragrant cup of coffee. Oh, you even bought me some gingerbread cookies. I love them. Why didn't you buy them for yourself? I didn't have anything to spare. As I told you, it all went towards paying for the house and the cottage. I sold the house yesterday and went to the bank today. Why didn't you buy anything yesterday? I was too tired yesterday. Nuria was horrified and angry that elderly people were forced to suffer from hunger while receiving a meager income. Anna, I need to go now. My children will be coming home from school soon. I've prepared some soup for you. 
Will you be able to help yourself if you get hungry? Of course, I'm not helpless. The old lady seemed visibly livelier after the delicious meal. I put some gingerbread cookies in the cupboard, along with fruits and wafers. Why did you get all this food? Take it with you. I didn't know what you liked, so I took a little of everything. I'll come by tomorrow. Here, take it, the woman said, handing Nuria a bundle of bills, half of what was in her purse. Have you lost your mind? You don't need to do this, Nuria recoiled from the money. I said, take it. You saved my life, fed me, and didn't leave me to die. What am I going to do with this money? She waved her hand toward the bills. I just need some gingerbread cookies, and you have a lot of expenses. Take it, don't hesitate. Maybe you can buy groceries for me sometime. It's hard for me to carry them. I didn't buy it for payment. I did it for no reason. I know, because you have a kind heart. But I want to thank you. Okay, I don't want to offend you. I'll take it, but just a little. What should I do with all this money? What do you mean? You use it to pay for the cottage and this apartment. Nuria gestured toward the neat and cozy apartment. My son and my husband bought this for us while he was still alive. What happened to him? He opened his own business and refused to pay all those cheeky people. So they got to him. He died that night, and my husband followed soon after as his heart couldn't take it. Anna, dear, sorry. I'm asking too many questions again. I already told you, remind me, or I'll forget everything. But you should go, or you'll be late. After picking up Valeriana from daycare and preparing dinner, Nuria waited for Marcelino and Anna to return from school. So, how was your first day at the new school? You know, unexpectedly, it was great. I can't remember the last time I felt so comfortable in a classroom. Nobody acted like they were the center of the universe. They welcomed me normally. The school is not as well equipped, but the teachers still know how to make lessons interesting. And the chemistry teacher is amazing, his knowledge is mind-blowing, although he's a young guy. Nuria was glad to hear that her daughter liked the new school. Anna wouldn't hide anything if something had gone wrong. She had been reluctant to talk about her old school, but today she was praising it. By the way, Mom, Marcelino wanted to tell you something. The girl winked at her brother. Yes, Mom, I apologized to the teacher and even got an A. Well done. In what subject? In social studies. Yesterday, Anna and I prepared a presentation about frogs, and I told it today. After these words, Anna and Nuria exchanged glances and couldn't help but burst into laughter. Today was so different from the previous day that Nuria was ready to believe that Anna might have a touch of magic in her. Valeriana, did anything interesting happen at daycare today? Nothing much. But I didn't get into any trouble today, and they praised me. For Valeriana, this was a significant achievement. Mom, how was work for you today? Did you make it there in the morning? No. By the way, I need to call my boss. However, no one answered. Nuria had to call her colleague, who was temporarily acting as the secretary, but was essentially a journalist. Oh, Nuria, today he's not available. His wife was taken to the hospital last night with a suspected heart attack. We've all been on edge, waiting all day to see if she'll recover. Will you be coming in tomorrow? I scheduled a full day for you today. What happened? Nuria explained the day's events to her colleague and promised to show her appreciation for covering for her. I should buy her some good coffee tomorrow. She likes it, Nuria thought to herself. Mom, did you rob a bank today? What? I mean, did you clear out a bank today? Anna asked, entering the room with a bundle of money in her hands. Where did I leave them? In the cupboard on the shelf. I must have been really absent-minded today. This was given to me by the elderly lady. I was in a hurry to get to work this morning, saw her unconscious on a bench, called an ambulance, went with her, and then brought her home. She's living in the same building as us now. By the way, she didn't have anything to eat. 
so I bought groceries, cooked for her, and fed her. That's how she thanked me. With each sentence, her daughter's eyes widened. Well, she had nothing to eat, and she thanked you with a wad of cash. I get it, Mom. Did you see the bills? She even wanted to give me more, but I refused. Mom, we need to take the money back. What if she changes her mind and reports you? You think so? Nuria herself began to doubt her actions. That old lady was a bit strange, to be honest. Come on, let's go quickly. Marcelino, keep an eye on your sister, Mom, and I need to step out for a moment. Nuria, not fully grasping why it hadn't occurred to her that the old lady might not have been in her right mind, obediently followed her daughter. Unexpectedly, Anna opened the apartment door before they had a chance to knock. What's wrong with people? No one trusts anyone these days. Why did you accuse your mom? I just gave her the money. I won't go complaining about her anywhere. The frail old woman literally stunned Anna with her objections. I didn't have a chance to warn you. She has some abilities. Nuria looked at her daughter with a smile. Well, yes, it's just a minor detail. Honestly, it seemed like Anna was about to turn around and leave the apartment. However, with a confident stride, she moved forward. Well, tell me. What's the story behind this miraculous grandma who significantly boosted our family budget? They returned half an hour later. Upon entering the apartment, Anna said, Mom, did you ever consider that she didn't just randomly appear in your life? To be honest, I haven't had the chance. The events of yesterday and today have been quite overwhelming. Well, think about this. Yesterday, everything was as bad as it could be, but today, everything is as perfect as it has ever been for us, almost never. Indeed, yesterday, each of us had so many problems, and today, they all seem to have been resolved, Nuria smiled. She hadn't even noticed how much today differed from yesterday. I'll visit her myself, Anna said confidently. You already have so much work to do at the office. I think it's best not to. After all, you have so many school assignments and tutoring sessions. Besides, she's not so helpless that she needs constant care. But I think we should keep an eye on her. What if there's something wrong with her mentally? It's not normal to be throwing money around like that. Of course, we won't take it and spend it on her, but what if unscrupulous people take advantage of her trust? I've been thinking the same thing, but she's not that old, and the doctor examined her today and didn't notice anything serious, just fatigue and heat, and later I found out about her hunger. Besides, our neighbors might suspect something if we keep going to her place all the time. You know, it's also strange that we've been living in this apartment for so long but have never seen her. The grannies are always sitting by the entrance, and I know most of their faces, but I've never seen her, that's for sure. I have a good memory for faces. You're right. Maybe she moved here recently? Did she mention it? No, but I didn't ask. She said her son gave her the apartment before he died. Judging by what she said, she's been living in this apartment for at least 30 years. You understand, not just a day or a week, but 30 years. Yeah, it's all very strange. Anna went to make some coffee. She and her mother had a tradition of discussing important matters over a cup of aromatic coffee with a waffle. I'll visit her after work tomorrow, tidy everything up, and cook something for her. The miracles in Nuria's family didn't end there. The very next day, they received a letter from the university where Nuria and Pablo had studied. Anna had participated in some competitions organized by the university and won. As part of the prize, winners were invited to attend free courses and subjects relevant to their intended majors to prepare for exams. It's strange that they're inviting us now. It's already the end of April. Yes, it would have made more sense to attend such courses throughout the year. Besides, we've already decided on our choice of universities. But I'm still going to attend it. You can never have too much knowledge. What if I don't get into the university I'm planning to attend? This could be a backup plan. Anna knew what she wanted to become. 
Ever since her father told her stories about his mountain expeditions, about the snow caps covering the peaks and the dizzying canyons, she knew her life would be connected to them. Even after her father's death, her dream not only remained but became more defined. Studying, learning, and deciphering the mysteries hidden in the mountains, that's what she dreamed of. The only problem was that the only available major that could get her closer to that dream was the geology and cartography department at the pedagogical university. While her mother was hoping she would become a famous writer or journalist, Anna pursued other fields of study. In reality, there weren't many opportunities in their city for prospective students. Anna never even dreamed of leaving her mother alone with two young children. It was a shame even to think about it. In middle school, Anna and her classmates went on a field trip to a nature reserve in a mountainous region. That day, she fell head over heels in love. How could anyone spend entire days in stuffy offices when such beauty existed in the world? How could you call anything beautiful if you'd never seen a mountain sunrise after a rainfall the day before? The day before, the tour guide who showed them all the sites briefly mentioned where he had graduated from. His work was indirectly related to his primary education. Now that Anna had almost graduated from school and was about to enter a university, she began to doubt her decision. She faced a difficult choice to leave her mother and study at one of the country's largest mountain institutes in the big city or stay in her hometown and become a geologist cartographer or a geography teacher, professions indirectly, if not theoretically, related to mountains. Time was running out. The graduation and entrance exams were approaching, and doubts still plagued her. Two years ago, she had decided which subjects she needed to be well prepared for. Now, she had no doubts about her knowledge, and even transferring from one school to another just before the last bell didn't bother her much. Anna knew for sure that changing schools was the least of her worries after the conflict with a classmate. Leaving the class where she had studied was not scary. There were many students at the elite school whose parents held prominent positions in the city. One of her father's clients helped Anna get into that school. She excelled academically, although she showed no interest in active school life. School parliament, staged events, and things like that didn't interest her. She read a lot and attempted to write short essays, but she didn't like to showcase her interests. Furthermore, she inherited an amazing ability from her father to easily learn languages. She and her father completed the school curriculum in just a couple of years, and Anna actively continued to develop her language skills by finding pen pals from other countries, significantly improving her proficiency. During her time in school, Anna tried various forms of creativity, but the arrival of her little brother and sister significantly reduced her free time, leaving only English and tutoring. Taking practice exams, Anna scored quite high, which allowed her to consider enrolling in a big city. However, there was still the question of how to pay for her accommodations. She couldn't share her concerns with her mother. Unexpectedly, a person with whom they could share any problem appeared in their lives. The lively old lady, also named Anna, had taken a liking to the visits from the young Anna. In just one week, they became close friends. Anna had already visited the university courses twice. The lecturers were constantly changing, and today's lecture was given by a fairly young and attractive man who occasionally cast a surprised glance at Anna and furrowed his brow, as if trying to remember something. When the students mentioned their surnames, he asked Anna to stay behind. Miss, are you, by any chance, Pablo Rubio's daughter? Yes, but my mother's last name is different. My parents were not married. That's why I didn't make a mistake when I thought you reminded me of him. His little sweetheart, the teacher said with a chuckle. Did you know my father? It's not just that. We were friends, but he stayed in town and started a family while I continued my studies. How is he, by the way? Who? My father? Yes. How is he? Obviously, not very well. Why? Anna looked at the man. No, he wasn't mocking. He genuinely didn't know about her father's fate. He died in the mountains almost six years ago. That can't be. He loved the mountains. He was such an experienced climber. What happened? 
Because of my birth, he hadn't been mountaineering for a long time, and after some illness due to oxygen deficiency, his heart couldn't handle it. Yes, he was very young, with a wife and a daughter. A wife, two daughters, and a son, Anna corrected. Well, he didn't waste any time, did he? The man laughed. He didn't learn about Valeriana's birth. She was born six months after he was gone. Valeriana's grandmother had only just begun to rejoice that her granddaughter was named after her and mom too. Well, that's not surprising. And how is Nuria doing? Did she get married after? Who? Mom? Oh no. She doesn't even look at anyone else. Dad was her ideal man. Well, I didn't know her well. It seems we were wrong. After all, nobody believed in their relationship. She was just a child, and he was the dream of every university girl. But look how it turned out. So, you've decided to enter your parents' alma mater? I haven't decided anything yet. I just won and wanted to make use of the prize. Do you teach here? To be honest, I'm a guest lecturer today. The teacher who was supposed to give the lecture today fell ill, so I volunteered. What do you teach? The history of the English language, language dialects, and obsolete or extinct languages. I also love English, but I want to study mining and mountains. Well, what's the problem then? There are plenty of specialized universities in the country. How are your studies going? I'm acing the practice tests, but leaving home and leaving my mom alone with the younger ones. Did your mom ask you to stay and help? No, of course not. She's strong. She'll never admit if she's struggling or tired. Then why do you think she won't cope without you? I don't know. The girl suddenly felt like she wanted to share her doubts with this man, who was connected to her father, someone she could trust with any secret, someone she could turn to with any problem. Tell her everything. Choosing a profession is one of the most important decisions in your life. Remember this, a mistake can cost you dearly, much more than realizing you're in the wrong field after investing your effort, resources, and time. But what if I'm not even sure if it's really what I want? What if I'm just seeing my future profession through my father's eyes? What if it was he who truly loved the mountains and was willing to dedicate his life to them? I can't help you with that, the man said, but I can offer advice. If you choose a foreign language, it's a lifelong commitment. Take my business card, call me if you decide to, and even if you don't, still call me. I'd be happy to help the daughter of an old friend. Where do you work? Anna asked as she stood in the doorway. Do you have any ideas? The man smiled mysteriously, nodding towards the business card in Anna's hand. Estenislo Aguilar, specialist in the history of the English language. There was the name of the university Anna wanted to attend on the business card. Such coincidences just don't happen, Anna thought. There were almost three weeks left until the last bell rang at school. Nuria continued to work calmly. The younger children hardly caused any trouble, and the eldest daughter walked around quietly, lost in thought. Nuria hadn't experienced such calmness in her life for a long time. Almost every day, either she or Anna visited Anna Ramos. The elderly woman, with all the attention, care, and help, had become rejuvenated and cheerful. She still didn't talk much about herself, but she was very interested in the lives of her newly found friends. On the weekends, she asked to be taken to the dacha to check on the house and see what had happened to the plot. The country house turned out to be quite an impressive building, with a spacious veranda and a gazebo. However, everything was overgrown and left a rather sad impression. Clearly, it lacked a homeowner's touch. My husband dreamed that we would live here and that our children and grandchildren would come here for weekends. We never even got a chance to set the table on the veranda, no grandchildren, no coffee on the veranda. While I had enough strength, I spent every summer here, and sometimes even the spring and autumn. There was no time to be sad about loneliness with gardening, but now all that's left are memories. That's why we've never seen you near the entrance. Nuria asked, opening the door to their home. What would I do there? Sit around and gossip with the neighbors? 
City folk have nothing better to do. I was born and raised in the village. I've always got something to keep me busy. I managed this summer house on my own until I was 75. Mother and daughter exchanged glances and simultaneously asked, How old are you, then? Approaching a hundred, I'm ninety-five. Wait, you don't look a day over seventy. Well, what can I say? That's how I've managed to be young, the old woman said with a satisfied smile, pleased with the impression she was making. I was quick and pretty in my youth, and I got married early, at seventeen. Why? Anna genuinely didn't understand why some girls rush into marriage straight from school. What else could I do? There was nowhere to study, and it was hard for my father to feed us. So, I got married and started working. Thank God, I got a good, kind, hard-working husband. We didn't have children for a long time. One day I had a dream that I would find my own son with another woman, along with a gift. What gift? This gift, for God's sake, is the ability to read thoughts and to know about people's pasts. I didn't need it, but nobody asked me. What do you mean he was another woman's son? Well, our family in the village was wayward and drinking, and there were seven children there, all hungry and dirty. Once, they came from the city and took them all away to an orphanage. All of them, but not quite all, as it turned out later. Perhaps their parents were drinking out of grief, and they didn't even leave the house. One day, I was passing by the house and heard a baby crying. Where could it have come from if all the children were taken away? I went in. It turned out that the parents had hidden one baby, the smallest one, and they had gone on a binge. Nobody knows how long he cried alone there. I took him with me. Just like that. And they didn't stop you? Didn't the neighbors ask where you got the child? Just like that, everyone knew it. That family soon perished in a fire, drunk and asleep with the stove still on. My husband and I decided to move to the city and bought a little house. Is that the house you sold before we met? Yes. Nuria and Anna listened as if enchanted. It seemed as if the life story of this remarkable woman, with all its sorrows and joys, was coming to life before them. Even the younger children stopped running around the house and poking into every corner. They became curious to hear more from their grandmother. That's how I became a mother. We couldn't get enough of our son. He grew up so well, tall, handsome, and smart. You wouldn't believe he was born into a family with drinking problems. After school, he got into college and became one of the top students. He didn't want to get married because he was dreaming of starting his own business. He and his friend managed to open a legal firm, but then local thugs started bothering them. It was a scary time in the country, with lawlessness and chaos. They offered my boy money to leave him alone, but he refused. That's when he was taken from us. Did they find the criminals? Who would even look for them? Cases like that happened every day, you know how many of them there were. And our son had just started his life, he bought an apartment for us with his father. I'm so sorry for your loss. Losing a loved one is very frightening. You should know how it feels too. The old lady took Nuria's hand. But you still have children. They are your joy and support. You need to live for yourself, not carry such a heavy burden. Leave your job, you don't need it. I can't, Nuria smiled. Anna is going to college, and we haven't bought anything for her graduation yet. Don't worry about Anna. I'll give you the money. The old lady raised her hand, anticipating objections. I have no one but you. You saved me. What do I need this money for? You can't take it with you to the other side. I have no one else to leave my inheritance to, just you. Let an old woman enjoy herself and admire our beauty. I wasn't planning on going to the graduation ceremony at the new school at all. I hardly know anyone, and in the old school, hardly anyone will remember me. You're not going for them, you're going for yourself. And we'll buy you the most beautiful dress. The old lady's eyes lit up with all these plans for the months ahead. Now it's time to take care of that dacha, I have no use for it. 
and it will be perfect for you and the children. In the evening, after putting the younger children to bed, Nuria finally decided to find out where her daughter would be attending college. Mom, I don't know. I want to go to the big city. But how will you stay here? Marcelino can be a handful for anyone, and Valeriana is quite a character. And now you have to look after Anna too. She's like a child. Daughter, I've already taken advantage of your kindness too often. I have no right to keep you by my side. If you've decided to go to college in another city, go for it. You're a good student. I'm sure you'll pass the exams without any problems. But have you firmly decided on foreign languages? You have such prospects in that field, and your writing is amazing. Finally, Anna decided to tell her mother about her acquaintance with her father's old friend. Nuria remembered Estenislo. He was indeed a friend of Pablo, a very serious, strict young man dedicated only to his studies. It was no wonder that his career was on the rise. She was pleased to learn that he also suggested that Anna choose foreign languages. What if you apply to both universities? I thought about it, but then I'd have to take additional entrance exams since I've already decided on my school subjects. I'm sure you can handle it. A month later, Nuria and Anna were sitting on a train, heading to the big city, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. She didn't dare dream of such good fortune. Ana Ramos had indeed paid for Anna's graduation, and she even asked them to take her along. With Anna's high scores on her exams, she could count on a government scholarship. Estenislo and his wife met them at the train station. Anna had called them in advance and asked to be their guests for a day. However, her father's old friend decided not only to escort them, but also to accommodate them at their home. They lived not far from his workplace. They didn't have children, so they were happy to host Anna. Estenislo supported Nuria's idea of applying to both universities. However, to be admitted to the foreign language program, one had to reside in the city for a minimum of two weeks. They had to take two exams and wait for the results. Nuria couldn't stay for too long. She had to return to her younger children, and her health didn't allow her to be away from them for more than a day. However, leaving her daughter in an unknown city with people she barely knew scared her. Unexpectedly, later that evening, the phone rang. Ana Ramos was calling. Ana had taught her how to use a mobile phone so that she could call for an ambulance if needed while they were away or just whenever she felt lonely. Nuria, how are things over there? How is Ana? It's complicated. Ana needs to stay here. How can I leave her? She has never traveled anywhere alone. She's a grown-up girl, Nuria. You've left your kids with her before, now you need to let her go off to study. And didn't you go to someone familiar? But how can I leave my daughter with people I hardly know? You can leave her, don't hesitate, they are good people, and they won't harm your girl. He knew her father, she's not a stranger to him, and his wife is kind. But how do you know that? I know it all as well as I know that you were writing a book all night yesterday. The old lady held a dramatic pause. Or am I mistaken? You're not mistaken, I really felt like writing. It's hard to believe that something good can come out of it. It will, I know it. Well, if you're so sure, then I'm at ease. It's high time for you to start living for yourself. You're young, and some people are getting married and having their first child at your age, and you've already counted yourself as an old lady. I don't consider myself a wreck at my age, like you do. What are you talking about? About a man. It's time for you to get married again. Your kids are all grown up now, Anna is almost at the age to engage, and Marcelino will grow up soon. Kids grow up. Do you want to spend your whole life alone? Just like me, tending to the garden at my summer house. But you also weeded, planted a garden, and tended to the flower bed. Yes, because I had no choice. Widows weren't allowed to get married again back then. And it was a different time. Men went astray, some drank, some died, and some went to jail. The good, hard-working ones were scarce, and they kept them close by. But I didn't take anyone away from their family. Now it's different. 
In your age group, both unmarried and childless young people are walking around normal, smart, and healthy. Anna, you won't be able to understand me. I don't want to get married. I don't need anyone. Pablo was the best of all the people I knew and will ever know. I don't want to betray his memory. I don't want to bring anyone into the house just for the sake of it. I don't want to adapt. If it weren't for his kids, I would have had no reason to live after he left. They saved me. Only for the sake of his children have I lived all these years. I know for sure that I won't find another like him. Oh, you've gotten all fired up. Well, if you don't want to get married, it's your choice. I wish you well. When are you coming home? I'm leaving tomorrow evening, and I'll be back the day after tomorrow. I'll stop by after work. Is something wrong? Do you need anything? Are you out of medicine? No, everything is fine. I just miss you. I've gotten used to not being alone, to your calls, to your visits. God sent you to me. It was you who were sent by God to me. After you appeared in our lives, things took a turn for the better. You can say that too, your life was already pretty good. Well, the kids made a little noise. But how else could you manage with three of them? Surprisingly, the call from the elderly woman really calmed her down, as if it were the missing piece of the puzzle that finally fell into place. In the morning, she agreed to leave her daughter for the entrance exams and headed back to buy a return ticket. She took the evening train home, leaving her eldest daughter in the city, which was now becoming her home. It felt like a huge piece of her had been taken away, as she and her daughter had become so closely connected. However, leaving her daughter with her would have been the height of selfishness, and Nuria understood that perfectly well. She was genuinely grateful to fate for bringing Anna and Estenislo into her life. Indeed, after meeting that wonderful old lady, Nuria's life miraculously changed for the better, and quite rapidly at that. Trying to distract herself, Nuria took out the notebook where she had started jotting down the outlines of a story the day before. It turned out to be a somewhat autobiographical tale inspired by recent events. She was so happy for her daughter, who was confidently pursuing her dream, that she decided to recall what she herself had once dreamed of doing. In the whirlwind of events over the past 17 years, there had been no room for such an important detail as her own dream. A dream of what she wanted to dedicate her life to. She had spent all these years giving birth, raising children, and figuring out how to provide for them. The thought of finding a job she loved had never crossed her mind. But now she had decided to start searching for herself, and her first attempt was to write a story. The next two weeks were filled with constant stress and worry for Nuria. Anna successfully passed her exams, applied to the second university, and was now awaiting the admission decision. Valeriana threw tantrums every morning and didn't want to go to daycare. The little girl missed her sister terribly, but stubbornly refused to admit it. Marcelino withdrew into himself. Raised by his sister, he couldn't imagine life without her. Despite having summer vacation and permission from his mom to play and explore, the boy spent his days alone in his room or flipping through books. Previously, he and Anna had a tradition to read about a new animal every day, discuss it, and come up with stories and tales. Now he was the eldest, as his mom used to say. And the burden of responsibility that had fallen on his shoulders made him even sadder. Anna had been the glue that held the family together. It turned out that Anna was just like Pablo in that sense. After his departure, Nuria couldn't find the strength to be a source of strength for anyone. Anna had taken on that role. The unassuming girl had become the pillar Nuria thought she had lost forever. Now, Nuria had to become the glue that held the family together, and she knew exactly how to do it. After stocking up on a pile of groceries and packing their things, Nuria decided to take the whole family to the summer house. This idea delighted the elderly owner of the summer house. Nuria was on vacation from work, so they could easily enjoy a break and tidy up the house. The woman decided to call her daughter. Anna's happy voice indicated that she was having a wonderful time. They were all taken to the dacha by taxi when it arrived while they were chatting. It's amazing how different summer is in the city compared to the countryside. 
The hot air, scorching roads, intense sun rays, unbearable heat, and humidity in the city give way to the cool shade of gardens, the gentle murmur of a river or stream, and the rustling of leaves swaying in the light breeze in the countryside. The house on the plot needed a thorough cleaning. A neighbor from the summer house area offered to mow the grass, which had grown almost waist high by midsummer. By evening, Nuria had managed to get the house in order. Anna was busy making the most delicate and fragrant pancakes, and the whole company sat down on the veranda to have coffee. For this special occasion, Nuria set up a small table on the veranda, where they all gathered. The pleasant scent of freshly mowed grass wafted from the lawn. Twilight was beginning to descend on the plot, shrouding objects and trees in a mysterious shadow. Somewhere nearby, a cricket started its evening song. In the mowed grass, cicadas chirped. In such a wonderful setting, all one wanted to do was sit and listen. Mom, will we stay here for long? Marcelino asked quietly, finishing his pancake. I think for about a week or so. Why? When will Anna come back? I miss her terribly. Judging by his expression, the boy was on the verge of tears and was barely holding back. Anna went away to attend university. She's grown up, and a new chapter in her life has begun. Doesn't she love me anymore? She loves you very much. But she can't always be with us. She dreamed of going to the big city. But I don't want her to leave, Marcelino whispered, and the first tears welled up in his eyes. Nuria hugged her son and kissed the top of his head. Sweetie, I understand that at some point Anna became your best friend, but we can't keep her at home forever. I feel sad too, but I'll be happy if she gets into the university and goes to live where her dream calls her. A couple of years will pass, and you will grow up, and then Valeriana. Remember how we used to watch the swallows? We saw them build their nest and hatch their eggs, and then the little ones grew up and flew away because they couldn't stay in the nest anymore. But there's enough space for everyone in our apartment. After these words, Marcelino stopped holding back his emotions and burst into tears, burying his face in his mother's lap. Son, I understand how hard this is for you, but I'm still here. Now, I'll be the one to read books with you and make up stories instead of Anna. You? You get tired from work, and we have Valeriana. And I. I misbehave. You scold me. Anna never scolded me. I scold because I get tired and upset, not because I don't love you. But Anna never scolded me. She always defended me. How about we play together? I'll spend the whole vacation learning to be like Anna, and in August, Anna will come back. We'll see if I can become more like her. Okay. The little one had almost calmed down, but his shoulders still trembled, and his nose was runny. Let's go. I'll put you to bed. I don't want to. You do. Besides, Valeriana is already asleep in the small bed. Okay, but I choose to sleep on the big bed and let Valeriana sleep on the small one. After all, I'm the older and more grown-up one. Well, of course, I'll sleep wherever is comfortable for me, Nuria smiled, tucking the children in and tidying up the table. Nuria discovered that Ana Ramos was also sleeping in a deep chair placed on the veranda specifically for her. The night promised to be quiet and warm, and the chair was soft and comfortable, so Nuria went to get a blanket to cover the old lady. When she returned, she tucked the woman in with the blanket and was about to step away, but she realized that the old lady wasn't moving at all. Checking her pulse, Nuria realized with horror that their wonderful acquaintance, their guardian angel, had quietly passed away on her beloved veranda among those who had become her family in her final days. She had managed to not only help and support them financially and morally, but had also illuminated their lives and made them see life differently, and her gifts had helped them make the right decisions. Sleep peacefully, our guardian angel. Spend your last night at your beloved summer house on this veranda that you built for a big family. Look, everything happened just as you planned. A big family, coffee on the veranda, and crickets chirping in the garden. Nuria sat down at a table near the old lady's chair and took the tiny, wrinkled hand in her own, which was already growing cold. She wanted to cry, 
but she held back, not wanting to spoil such an evening with tears. We won't shed tears right now, all right? We'll figure everything out tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, we'll cry. I won't tell Anna yet. She hasn't received the exam results. The next morning, while the children were still asleep, Nuria called for an ambulance and the police. They took away the tiny, lifeless body to perform all the necessary procedures. Nuria took the children to their grandmother's house and picked up the phone to call her eldest daughter. She knew she had no right to upset her daughter at this moment, but she couldn't avoid sharing such news. Mom, what happened? Her daughter's anxious voice caught Nuria off guard. She couldn't hold back her tears anymore. Mom, is it Ana Ramos? By her daughter's voice made it clear that she had understood everything. When did it happen? Yesterday late in the evening, we were at the summer house. We're going to accompany her on her final journey tomorrow. Don't come, you need to wait for the results. Mom, I'll book a ticket and come right away. You can't handle this on your own. Anna, I'll manage. You've already taken on too much responsibility for me in the past. Remember? I'm your mother, not the other way around. You have important things to do. Our kind-hearted angel will watch over us from above. Don't come until you've decided which path to take. For the first time in her life, Anna didn't object or argue. It was evident that she was crying too. The dear old lady, who always told them the truth, had become a part of their lives in just a couple of months. It was a shame that they had met her only now, but perhaps they had met her precisely when she was needed most. They say miracles don't happen, but meeting her was a true miracle. In the evening, after saying goodbye to Anna, Nuria decided to go into the late woman's apartment to try to find information about any relatives. They still had to resolve the issue of the apartment and the country house. During her lifetime, the woman often said that she had no relatives other than her husband and son, but there might have been some distant relatives. As she went through many photos, Nuria discovered an envelope. It was clear that it had been purchased and sealed recently. There was even a date on it, the day Nuria and Anna had left. The contents of the envelope reaffirmed to Nuria that this woman had come into her life for a reason. Inside the envelope were documents for the apartment and the country house, a letter, and gift deeds. One for Anna and the other for Valeriana. The letter contained just one sentence, for our girl's future. While they were away, the old lady had contacted a notary and transferred her property to the people who had become her family, providing the care she had longed for in the last 30 years. For the next nine days, out of habit, Nuria kept wanting to visit the old lady or call her to inquire about her health. Even Marcelino had been trying to hold himself together during these days and not cry about Anna's departure. Returning home in the evening after visiting the cemetery, Nuria called her daughter. Yes, Mom. What's up? What delightful surprise do you have for me today? I've been waiting for your call all day. Did you decide to keep me in suspense for a while? Mom, I... For the first time in her life, Anna didn't object or argue. It seemed like she couldn't find the right words. It didn't work out? Her mother cautiously asked, understanding how difficult it was for her daughter to come to terms with the shattered hopes of studying in the most beautiful city. No, Mom, I... I got accepted to both universities. I still can't believe it. Estenislo went with me to the mining university to confirm it, and he called the foreign languages department as well, and I passed there too. Well done, I never doubted you. You make me proud. Have you decided where you'll study? Yes, I submitted the original documents today. Anna remained silent, but Nuria didn't rush her. I've decided that Dad's dream about the mountains is his dream. I've developed a love for them too, but I want to pursue a different field in my life. Besides, Dad also graduated in foreign languages, and Estenislo will be teaching there in some capacity. Nuria could hear the smile in her daughter's voice. And in the background, she heard a female voice. That's right, Anna. Let him help. He convinced you to apply there. Let him see you through to graduation. After these words, they both laughed. 
It was clear that Anna was doing well in her new environment. Mom, I forgot to mention. They've assigned me a room in the dormitory. I'll be like a real student now. I think that's for the best. It will help you integrate into student life more quickly. Well, it looks like my mom is supporting me now, she said deliberately loudly for her mother. And then she explained to her mom. My foster family doesn't want to let me go. They say I won't be able to study in the dorm. Daughter, I can see that you've gotten along with them. Nuria was glad that her daughter had friends in an unfamiliar city who were ready to support her in difficult times. Of course, we've gotten along. I felt small and helpless again. You've never been small and helpless. I think you were born mature and thoughtful. Mom, how's Marcelino doing? I miss him so much. He's hanging in there. He was upset and cried at first, but after the funeral, he's trying to be more grown up. We read together and create stories, and the other day he was building something for Valeriana. Oh, he's quite the determined one. Tell him I'll be coming soon. What should I bring them as a gift? Yourself. He hasn't asked for anything for himself during the time you've been away. And Valeriana? Valeriana, like a true little girl, cries, gets sad, and acts capricious. We all miss you, you're our cornerstone, and without you, we can't come together as a family. Turns out it's hard to let go of children. Mom, at your age, some people get married and have their first child, and you're talking like an old lady. You just repeated exactly what Anna told me. No surprise, we've been on the same vibes since day one, and we're even namesakes. No way, new marriages and new children are definitely not in the cards for me. I have you, and your dad was here. I don't need anyone else, and I'm not even thinking about new relationships. I'll be waiting for you to introduce me to your better half. That evening, Nuria couldn't sleep. She remembered the past years, which had flown by unexpectedly fast, and the last few months, which had been more eventful than some entire years of her life. Suddenly, the day before, she had met the mysterious old woman. On that day, it seemed like all the troubles that life could bring had fallen on her head. Problems had woven themselves into such a tight knot that she couldn't see a way to unravel it, yet the very next day, as if by the wave of a magic wand, everything fell into place. So she spent the entire night lost in thought and memories. Outside, dawn was breaking. How much beauty and untapped energy lie in the awakening world. How easy it was to breathe the invigorating morning air. Everything around me was so quiet, peaceful, and serene. Perhaps that's why inspired, purpose-driven, and enthusiastic people try to wake up early and devote their morning hours to themselves, measured, unhurried, and filled with a special charm. Nuria had no intention of meditating or going for a run. Taking out her notebook, she began to write a new chapter of her book. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.